evening, folks. Welcome to this evening's presentation. Um, we have tonight Mr. Russell Doré, who will be teaching us about the electric cars of the past, present, and future. Mr. Doré is a board member of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area, a member of the Northville Historical Society, and a member of the Henry Ford Heritage Association. He is an automotive historian and holds a bachelor's, bachelor's, master's, and doctoral degrees in social sciences from Michigan State and the University of Washington. Mr. Doré. Thanks. It's nice to be with you folks again. I've done some uh, live and some Zoom programs, and uh, uh, they're they're both fun. Uh, I you know we all prefer the live. I think uh, a little bit more, but uh, electric cars were predominant. Hi. Somebody needs to mute, I think. Um, electric cars were the primary cars in the early 1900s, and then they disappeared pretty much. Uh, and then they came back in the 2000s. So we're going to find out why they disappeared and why they came back. We're also going to look at some of the early pioneers that were responsible for the early electric cars and some of the modern pioneers who were responsible for the modern electric cars. So let's start at the beginning. This uh, electric powered vehicle was driven in Paris in 1881 by its inventor, Gustav Trouvé. It's considered one of the first working automobiles. For comparison, the first practical gasoline powered vehicle was attributed to Carl Benz five years later in 1886 in Germany. The first electric vehicles used lead acid batteries. First production electric car was built by Thomas Parker in London in 1884. Thomas Edison got interested in electric cars. He was interested more from the battery angle. Uh, so he had his batteries installed in several makes of cars. And uh, he, he had an interesting statement that uh, I, I think uh, is, is enjoyable and, and relevant today. He said, electricity is the thing. There is no whirring and grinding gears with their numerous levers to confuse. There is not that almost terrifying uncertain throb and whir of the powerful combustion engine. There is no water circulating system to get out of order, no dangerous and evil smelling gasoline and no noise. Well, it's hard to argue with that uh, either then or now. William Morrison of Des Moines, Iowa is credited with building the first successful battery-powered electric car in America. He was Scottish-born. He arrived in Des Moines in uh, 1880. And again, his chief interest was batteries. He built an electric vehicle in 1880, 1890 to use his batteries, and he received much interest at the World's Fair in 1893. This was the first hybrid automobile, produced from 1900 to 1905. Much like the modern hybrids, it had an electric, well, it had an electric motor in each wheel hub, gave it four wheel drive, could run on either the battery powered electric motor or the gasoline engine, but it was very heavy due to the 44 lead acid batteries. Can you imagine a car with 44 batteries like our, uh, our uh, car batteries? Um, and was very expensive. A few were built for European royalty. They did use the technology to build some rear wheel drive buses uh, for Berlin. This is a um, 1906 French electric car produced by the Krieger Company of Paris. Shown in the car are its, are its owner, George Wetmore and his wife. He was at that time a US Senator from Rhode Island, later became governor of Rhode Island. The uh, Krieger automobile were the first to use regenerative electric brakes, which they're still using today. In 1903, Krieger also produced a hybrid. It had front wheel drive, power steering, and a gasoline engine that supplemented the battery pack. I'm going to tip my screen down here a little. I have a colorized version of that uh, on my shirt. My uh, daughter Kelly found it for me online. Uh, when, when the, she knew I was doing these presentations, so it's kind of cool. When the U.S. Baker Electric Vehicle Company was founded in 1899 in Cleveland, 
And in 1906, they produced 800 cars and they were the largest electric car manufacturing in the US, manufacturer in the US. One was sold to Thomas Edison. He used his nickel iron batteries uh, in it. The Baker Electric was part of the first White House fleet of cars driven by Helen Taft, wife of President Taft. In 1908, the Detroit Electric began making cars and surpassed the Baker Company in and to become the largest company. Clara Ford, Henry Ford's wife, drove a Detroit Electric until Ford added self-starters in 1919. Um, you know, women didn't like to turn the crank. Some of them didn't have the strength. Also, if you weren't careful, a crank can back up and break your wrist. So uh, it, it wasn't a, a favorite, particularly among the women. Uh, and uh, she actually uh, drove this until there were electric starters and then kept it a little bit after that. She, she enjoyed her Detroit Electric. Uh, it was purchased in 1914 for $3,700 and had a range of 80 miles. Well, we need to uh, talk about Henry and his Model T because it had a big impact on the electrics. So the same year as the Detroit Electric started, Henry Ford introduced his Model T. His company had been in existence for five years. Through the use of the assembly line, he reduced the price from 850 to $260 a car. He captured 50% of the market. So now people had the choice of this low priced gasoline vehicle with far greater range than the electrics. And uh, this started the demise of the electric cars. Then when self starters were added by Ford in 1919, it further drastically reduced the appeal of the electric. So Henry's success with the Model T had quite an impact on it. However, in spite of that, um, by 1913, Henry Ford began to explore developing an electric car with Thomas Edison. This experimental vehicle is shown outside his Highland Park plant. He insisted on using Edison's nickel iron batteries, uh, which weren't working as well as the lead acid batteries that other people worked, but Edison was his buddy. So that's, that's what he wanted to uh, use his batteries. The range of the car was only 50 to 100 miles between charges. And again, the Model T had come way down in price and so the electric uh, project was dropped. As we'll see later, 100 years after this, Ford is investing billions in building electric cars. Well, was, was this a mistake for Henry to get out of it? No, of course not. The technology was just not there at that time. Now we have to jump ahead to the 60s. Pollution from automobiles and industrial sources became a major problem, particularly in California. Los Angeles sits in a basin surrounded by mountains. The ocean winds drive the air up against the mountains and the warm air traps it in the basin. I lived there in the early 70s. When you flew into LA, you couldn't even see the buildings. You just saw this layer of brown until you flew under the smog level and could see the city. Um, the Pasadena track team had to be bussed out of the valley to practice because of the concern of pollution on their, on their lungs. So research began to show that the automobile was one of the main sources of pollution and the Clean Air Act was passed in, in 1963. And then in 1970, President Nixon formed the EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, and uh, set up regulations to reduce the carbon dioxide gases. Of course, this started again in interest in an alternative and, and uh, people started looking at electricity again. A couple of interesting early ones. The Sun Racer was a race car financed by GM, powered by solar cells instead of batteries, feeding into silver zinc batteries. It carried one person, weighed uh, 575 pounds, it was built for a solar car race in Australia. It won the race and a couple of follow-up models were developed, but the concept never went anywhere although they did use their technology. Enter a young man named Wally Ripple. It was one of the interesting pioneers, I think, that we'll talk quite a bit about. 1968, he was an undergraduate student. He built the Caltech electric car. Uh, obviously, it's a converted 58 VW microbus filled with batteries, as you can see. But he won the great transcontinental electric car race against MIT. 
while he was uh, worked for Jet Propulsion Laboratory on electric vehicle battery research in the 70s and, and 80s. And among other things, in 1990, he joined a company called Air Aerovironment and helped to design the GA GM Impact, later named the EV1, which we'll talk about. I wondered about this company, Aerovironment, and I looked it up. They're still in business. They make switchblade um, drones that we're providing to the Ukraine. Another interesting car back in these days in 1998, this 72 Datsun was loaded with batteries, won many drag races against gasoline powered cars with high horsepower engines because there's no transmission to slow down the transfer to the wheels. So this got people's attention. They began to realize the potential of electric cars. In 96, GM introduced the EV1, an all electric four passenger car using some of the technology from the Sun Racer. You couldn't buy one, you had to lease it from a Saturn dealer, which was part of GM. Mel Gibson and Danny DeVito were early customers. It cost far more to build and was covered by the lease payments. So GM lost heavily on this project. Well, they decided not to go ahead with it uh, for further refinements. Uh, they have one of these at the Henry Ford Museum. And the reason is, is because they consider it was the first serious attempt in the US at mass produced electric vehicles. And that, that's why it has its place in history. Well, for uh, corporate uh, image and liability reasons, uh, they started crushing all these cars. They didn't want them out there. They couldn't service them. And uh, they knew people would be unhappy with them. So uh, when they came off a lease, uh, they, they crushed them. In 2003, Wally Ripple was one of the participants in a mock funeral for the EV1 as GM prepared to collect the last few for crushing. Ripple left Aerovironment in 2006 and joined a company we'll talk more about, Tesla Motors, where he continued his lifelong work on battery electric cars. He left Tesla in 2008. You know, Wally Ripple, you've never heard of, I had never heard of him. Um, you know, he's almost a Henry Ford of the electric cars. And I think, uh, I think we ought to start a Wally Ripple fan club or something to recognize this, uh, this early pioneer. In 2006, a movie was produced examining the forces that killed the EV-1. And these reasons were the environmental regulations and the auto industry executives were very conservative. Rick Wagner, GM's former CEO who shut the program down, said later in life that his worst decision as a CEO was axing the EV-1 electric car program and not putting resources into electrics and hybrids and giving GM an edge that they could have had. Well, Honda got involved in 1999. This was the first hybrid available in the US until the Prius was introduced in 2009. The Honda ZE1 was followed by the Honda Insight, one time was one of the best-selling hybrids in the US. Toyota Prius was introduced in Japan in 97, making it the world's first mass-produced hybrid. It was introduced in the US in 2000. Features a battery and a gasoline engine. The battery is charged when the car brakes and by gasoline engine, which runs when needed. The computer decides which is the most efficient at any point in, in the trip. It was named Car of the Year by Motor Trend in 2004. And by 2011, they had sold 50% of all the hybrid cars in the US. Uh, Toyota also has now a new hybrid electric SUV called the BZX4. Um, some of the automotive writers are having fun with that, saying uh, somebody asks you what kind of a car you drive, and you have to say BZX4, which doesn't seem to mean a whole lot. Anyway, several celebrities drove a Prius. Larry David, writer of the Seinfeld show, owned one. Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, own one. This gave a lot of visibility to the Prius and to electric hybrids in general. The Nissan Leaf was introduced in 2000, and it became the world's best-selling electric hybrid from 2011 to 14. 
manufactured in Japan, Britain, and Smyrna, Tennessee. Ford got into the act in 2005 <clears throat> with its first hybrid, the Escape SUV. They then added the Fusion sedan in 2010. Again, motor trend car of the year that year. Chevy got involved with the Volt hybrid. Although a hybrid, it operated as a pure electric vehicle until the battery level dropped to a certain level and then a small gasoline engine ran to take it over. It was Motor Trend Car of the Year that year. It became the all-time best-selling plug-in electric car in 2018. Yes, that is President Obama driving this vault to promote electric car development. BMW got in the act in 2015 with the i3 hybrid. Chrysler came out with a Pacific, Pacifica hybrid minivan in 2017. VW introduced the e-Golf hybrid in 2019. Honda has a hybrid. Hyundai has a Tucson hybrid. Toyota has a Highlander and a RAV4. So everybody's getting, uh, getting involved. Jeep came out with the hybrid models of the Wrangler and the Grand Cherokee. The Cherokee is being built at the Stellantis Mack Avenue plant in Detroit. The first new plant in Detroit in 30 years. Jeep forecasts 70% of its sales will be electrified by 2025. President Biden drove one of these around the White House grounds at a recent press meeting. I don't know if you happen to see that, but they had a whole bunch of them lined up and they asked if he wanted to drive one and that's the one he picked and had a good time. Let's look at two more uh, electric car pioneers. Martin Eberhardt was an electrical engineer and co-founder of Tesla Motors in San Carlos, California in 2003 and its first CEO. Unfortunately, he left the company uh, in 2008 under accusations of falsifying financial data. Mark Tarpening was another co-founder. He and Martin Eberhardt founded Nouveau Media, a company that built an early ebook, The Rocket Book. In 98, Gemstar TV Guide acquired their company for $187 million. That gave them money to get into the automotive business. So they collaborated and founded Tesla Motors. They named it after Nikola Tesla, the Serbian American pioneer of alternating current. Tarpening served as the chief financial officer and later as vice president of electrical engineering in Tesla until 2008 when he left the company. Another co-founder, Jeffrey Staubel, was chief technical officer until 2019. He graduated from Stanford, BS in energy systems engineering, MS in energy engineering. Um, he recently founded a new company, Redwood, to recycle battery elements such as nickel and lithium. They feel they can recover 90% of the elements, which are very hard to get and very expensive. Well, we mentioned Tesla, and of course, um, you all recognize this fella. Uh, Elon Musk, who's the CEO of Tesla. Uh, interesting background. He was born and raised in Pretoria, South Africa, moved to Canada when he was 17, attended Queen's University, later transferred to the University of Pennsylvania, got a bachelor's degree in economics from Wharton School, bachelor's degree in physics from uh, College of Science and the Arts. He started a PhD in applied physics, but he uh, left after two months to become an entrepreneur. Uh, I doubt if he'll ever go back and, and finish his degree. Um, so he co-founded a company called Zip2 with his brother Kimball. This was a web software company. And that was acquired by Compaq for $340 million in 1999. They took that money and founded X.com, an online bank, which merged with Cofinity in 2000. They're the people that had PayPal. And then they were bought by eBay for 1.5 billion. So that's where Elon Musk got his money to get into the auto industry. So he founded SpaceX first, a space company, which you've seen his rockets uh, launched on TV. And uh, he also has a, uh, uh, a company making solar panels. 
but he joined Tesla in 2004, the year after it was founded. So he was not the founder of Tesla. He bought in after a year after it was already founded. Became its CEO and product uh, architect. Um, in January uh, 2021, he became the richest man in the world with a net worth of $202 billion. Now maybe he can uh, afford a necktie. I guess he never read the book, Dress for Success. And of course, you've been reading about him uh, lately because he's been, uh, uh, he just bought, um, oh, what's the um, online uh, company? Uh, Twitter. Twitter. Twitter, yeah. And he's, he's had tweet or something of Twitter. So uh, uh, a very interesting guy, richest man in the world. So what did they start out with? Well, they started out with a 2008 Roadster. Uh, and uh, this used lithium ion batteries, the first production electric car to travel more than 200 miles on a charge based on a Lotus chassis. Then they came out with the Model S all electric five door liftback sedan. And uh, it had higher range than any other car at the time, built in California, priced at about eighty thousand uh, dollars, and the fuel economy is equal to about a dollar a gallon uh, in terms of what you have to pay to charge versus what you'd have to pay to uh, to buy gas. And it became the top-selling plug-in electric car worldwide in two thousand fifteen and sixteen. Now the later models have an option of autonomous driving. We'll talk more about that, but it allows the car to operate without assistance from the driver, but the driver must supervise continuously and take control if there's an issue. Now, unfortunately, they called it autopilot, and a lot of people thought that you didn't have to pay much attention. There had been uh, at least one fatal crash using autopilot, but the driver was not paying attention uh, and took over when he, when he should have. Uh, later models have a um, enhanced summon it allows the car to drive through a parking lot to find you. My son has a Model 3, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And I asked him if he ever used it. He said, yeah, a couple of times he's been at a restaurant and he's hit the key and the car drives up and, and picks him up. So the uh, Tesla Model S, really the chassis is, is, the, ba is the battery or the battery is the chassis. Uh, Tesla then came out with a Model X SUV featuring gullwing doors. Then they came out with the Model 3, which is a little lower priced in the, um, well, 50, 45 to $55,000 range. And this is interesting. Um, as a company, Tesla's value is more than GM and Ford combined. I'm going to repeat that. Tesla's value on the market, stock market, is more than GM and Ford combined. And this is in spite of the fact that electric cars were less than 3% of the market last year. The high valuation is not based on current sales, but on future potential. And the uh, stock market investors feel that the potential is there. Uh, GM, Ford, and Stellantis earn more profits than Tesla, but uh, again, uh, the investors think that uh, electrics are, are in the future. Hertz ordered 100,000 of these Model 3s for their rental fleet. So if you want to try out an electric car, uh, next time you need to rent a car, try out a, a Hertz uh, Tesla Model 3. They came out with a Model Y crossover. It has a third row option and uh, comes in four-wheel drive only. They then came out with the Bolt electric, or Chevy came out with the Bolt electric. Uh, all electric. This is Motor Trend Car of the Year in 2017. This is made at the Lake Orion plant right here in the Detroit area. Um, electric car customers are allowed a $7,500 tax credit, but once a, man a manufacturer sold 2,000 cars, customers no longer get it. So unfortunately, GM has reached that cap. Senator Stabenow tried to get that raised um, a few years ago, but it failed in Congress. But as I understand, it is included in the uh, new um, um, Inflation uh, Reduction Act. 
So it may be that those um, 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 tax credits are coming back. Here's a, a Tesla or a, a, a bolt battery being replaced. And you notice it's not the whole chassis. So they can, they can um, uh, replace the batteries easier than, uh, than they can in some of the early, uh, early Teslas where it really was the whole chassis. So what about Ford? Will Ford put all his chips on the new all electric Mustang? Uh, Mach-E SUV, 300 mile range. Again, uh, won some awards, sells for about uh, 3,500 after the tax incentive. I don't know if it's still available on Ford, but they're investing 11 and a half billion in electric car development. So they took quite a gamble. They took one of their best brands, Mustang, and made it their electric car. So if it doesn't go, not only is it messed up their electric car business, but it's messed up one of their, uh, their big brands. So they really, uh, they really obviously believe in it. Uh, since there's no noise with these cars, uh, people like to have some sound. So they have some sounds created by an electronic sound artist inspired by science fiction film soundtracks. So I don't know if you get to choose your, your noise or not. Ford is also working with Purdue University to develop a charging cable. They've got a, they found that the charging uh, is slowed down by the cable. And, uh, and if this new cable supposedly will charge in five minutes instead of 25 minutes. So uh, there are just constant things going on in this industry. I have to revise my presentation every week or two, keep up. Uh, this was interesting. The Ford did a cross country trip to promote the Mustang. Um, and uh, it replicated the trip made by Ford Model T back in 1909. So they had this replica. It's, it's really a Model T racer. Uh, that it's not the original one, but it was uh, a, a real Model T made to look like the, the racer that did the cross country thing. And they had that at the start and the finish of this trip. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be invited by my nephew to look at this uh, Model T at uh, a restoration shop in Wixom when they were getting it ready for the trip. Uh, it was, it was kind of neat. Let's look at some other uh, early pioneers. Uh, Bob Tianaka is a uh, Ford battery guy. He designed space batteries for NASA, worked on the uh, batteries for the successful Jupiter probe mission. He lives in Plymouth, Michigan. He was a car guy at age two. You can see him there in his toy car uh, at an early age, he said. And then he got concerned about smog in LA, studied chemical engineering, has a great sense of humor. He said, when I was nine, I was certain I was going to become a baseball player for the LA Dodgers. In junior high, a career survey said I should become a park ranger. I figured that I'd do that after playing baseball. But he got cut from the varsity baseball team in the 11th grade. So he says, now when I retire from Ford, I'll work for the Detroit Tigers as an usher, com uh, combining his park ranger thing with his... Um, uh, with his interest in, uh, in um, uh, baseball. Another guy, uh, R.J. Scaringe, CEO of Rivion in Plymouth, Michigan. He, he, he uh, had a love affair with all things that move, he puts it, he, as a child. And then as soon as he was old enough to handle tools, he helped a neighbor rebuild a Porsche in his garage in Florida. High school, he became obsessed with the idea of building his own brand of automobiles. And he gained knowledge to do it by earning his doctorate in mechanical engineering from MIT. He spent years building a dream team of engineers in Plymouth, Michigan, including Mark Vinnels, Rivian's executive director of engineering, who came from McLaren, and Jeff Hammond, vice president of design and a veteran of Jeep, where you always saw the Grand Cherokee and the Wrangler. Now, where did he get his money? Well, he raised $450 million from three major investors in Saudi Arabia, Japan, and London. Incidentally, if he looks young, it is. Uh, he was born in 1983, which makes him 39, I think. 
So Rivian is building a seven seat sport utility vehicle and a pickup truck. Uh, they're based on the same uh, chassis. They include up to 400 miles of range, nearly 75 miles of range more than other electric cars currently in the pipeline and supposedly exceptional handling and sports car speed. Um, the pickup will have a base price around 68,000 and the SUV around 72,000. Now the company expects to deliver 20,000 units uh, delivered them last year and 40,000 this year. But of course, everybody ran into um, supply chain problems. So they, they, didn't quite, uh, they didn't quite make it, I don't think. These are built in a normal Illinois in a former Mitsubishi plant. If you get a chance, go to the Rivian website. There's a real neat video that shows these things in operation. It's really fun. So like many, uh, Electric vehicle makers, Rivian uses a skateboard design as the foundation, incorporating a battery pack and everything into the chassis. Each wheel is powered by an electric motor mounted between the hubs, and they have three different levels of battery. To you know, The top one gets a range of 400 miles. So Rivian had a major breakthrough in um, 2019. Um, Amazon announced that it would be investing uh, uh, 700 million into Rivian and Ford Motor Company invested uh, 500 million in Rivian, which I read recently, they may be selling that off and a couple other companies. So they've raised $1.5 billion. Um, now, Amazon ordered uh, 100,000 vans for their fleet. And they'll be putting them in uh, about uh, uh, 10,000 a year over a period of time. So that was a major, major uh, coup for them for getting their sales pushed forward. Uh, they're coming out with a pickup truck. Um, in 2021 in November, Rivian stock jumped 30% on the first day of public trading. Uh, market valuation was 109 billion more than Ford or GM, not Ford and GM, but more than Ford and GM. So the market really, really is valuing these. Uh, then again, in uh, May uh, uh, of 22, it dropped down to 25 billion because of these supply chain problems. So uh, they weren't able to deliver everything as fast as they thought. A few other things happening. Motive Power System provides electric power systems to electrify Ford E45 trucks from Ford's Avon Lake plant in Ohio. And uh, they're planning electric versions of its transit delivery van. Uh, Roush is electrifying uh, mid-sized uh, vans for Penske by mounting an electric motor and battery in a Ford van built in the Detroit area and being tested in California. Now, Tesla came out, you've probably seen pictures of this, of a, of a pickup uh, or electric truck, a uh, completely different look. Uh, we'll, see, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and believe it or not, Tesla's gonna have semi-trucks that have electric motors in about 400 miles. Now these would be used for short haul ranges around town, around communities, but the big, Benefit there is they could be plugged in every night and, and recharge. Uh, it doesn't work so well for the long haul trucks. But it uh, again, when you're paying a dollar equal equivalent of a dollar a gallon for gasoline instead of three or four dollars a gallon, you can see why the trucking companies are, are very interested in that. Ford is, uh, came out with the uh, F series truck called the Lightning. And um, they're going to have a hybrid version of that. They're going to start at around the top line models, around 100,000, and then work down to uh, $40,000 models. Uh, they are so popular that Ford uh, has a deal with the dealers where uh, if they sell it over list, 
uh, the Ford will, will um, take them to court. And also their customers have to sign an agreement. They will not resell it within a year. They don't want people buying these and then flipping them as, as because of the scarcity. So people are, are very interested. Uh, then they have a smaller truck, uh, compact Ford hybrid. Now this gets down to where many people can afford a car, $20,000 for the Maverick uh, hybrid. And um, now Toyota, interestingly enough, um, they're bringing out a, a hybrid, but uh, they're not gonna bring out an all electric because uh, they feel that the electrics suffer from, people wanna tow something, trailers and uh, other things like that. You lose a lot of range by towing. So they're going after that market of people who want to tow. And so they're going to stick with hybrids rather than all electrics. GMC uh, brought out the Hummer pickup and uh, that's being made in Hamtramck at the newly named plant Zero. Uh, and uh, they're also building a battery plant in Lansing, GM is. Chevy's offering the electric version of the Silverado. Again, they're starting out with the top line models at 100,000 and uh, eventually uh, working down to a $40,000 version. Um, Chrysler has been talking about a minivan, uh, feature sliding front and rear doors. Um, they're also uh, partnering, partnering with a new battery company which will hopefully increase vehicle range by 50%. So there's just all kinds of things going on here. I don't have a picture of this one, but there's another new company, Lucid, that uh, high-end car that out in Silicon Valley that won a Car of the Year award. And uh, the former vice president of vehicle engineering at Tesla is heading that up. So there's just stuff going on constantly. A um, couple of things that didn't go so far, Lordstown Motors, uh, they were going to have uh, a car, but they uh, had some financial problems and uh, um, kind of installed on that. Bollinger is a small company in Ferndale. They postponed manufacturing and they're just providing battery platforms to other companies, commercial companies. Now, if you really want something more powerful and zippy, you can get a electric Porsche, uh, 750 horsepower, and uh, but it only has a range of 192 miles, but you can get it for 186,000, you know, if you really want to have some fun. Uh, another one that I don't have a picture of yet, but it's going to be a lot of fun, is the uh, VW electric uh, microbus. VW has come out with one in Europe, uh, electric version of the old uh, microbus. And uh, you're going to be seeing those in the States before too long, I'm sure. So let's talk about self-driving electric vehicles for a little bit. Uh, GM is building this self-driving taxi type vehicle, investing uh, $2 billion in the Detroit Hamtramck plan to build this in the Hummer. Cadillac has come out with the Lyric. Uh, electric car, and it's going to have self-driving features, uh, again, starting at $60,000. You've seen a lot of ads by this beautiful car. Now, GM is so invested in the electric, they've actually changed their logo. Uh, the M represents a plug, and the line under it represents their Ultium battery platform, which they're going to use in all their electric vehicles. So uh, they really made a, a commitment there. Now here's a self-driving vehicle. It's kind of historic, has no driver's seat. Uh, it was the first vehicle to be cleared by the government to operate totally without the presence of a human. And it delivers packages limited 25 miles an hour in neighborhoods. And uh, it's been tested uh, out West and, and approved. And you've seen pictures of them, some of them with a, um, Domino's Pizza logo on it. Uh, Domino's is using it in some places to deliver pizza. Uh, IXR company has a mobility project uh, locally. They're going to have uh, a 12-passenger shuttle self-driving 
for mechanical or medical appointments and pharmacy visits and shopping. This is going to serve the Detroit Medical Center, VA Hospital and Complex, and 17 nearby senior housing uh, high-rise apartments. Now, most of these do have a spot for a person. Uh, it's autonomous, but the person is there to take over in situations where the self-driving can't handle it. But eventually, of course, they're uh, going to be totally self-driving. You've probably seen some of the Waymo cars around. Google subsidiary Waymo has opened its driverless taxi service to the public in Arizona, it's tested for five years. This uses radar, cameras, and LIDAR, which is a uh, system using later, uh, lasers. They use the Chrysler Pacifica for their hybrid minivans. Uh, another thing that I just read about is that Michigan State University has a self-driving bus that runs around a track uh, and um, delivers students from one point to another. And it's integrated with the traffic light system. So as the bus approaches, it changes the traffic light and so forth. And again, it's totally autonomous. Right now, of course, it has a, a human being there as a as a backup. Well, let's look at a few uh, figures on on uh, this industry. The uh, uh, they they looked at different countries, and of course, Norway Norway has is a tremendous leader in the percentage of plugins. They actually in this uh, graph treat California as a separate country. It's so different than some of the rest of the U.S. And they're up to thirteen. Uh, plug-in cars per thousand people, and the U.S. in total is at about three. Uh, this is a registrations uh, per thousand people, and uh, you notice it ranges from about eight in California to about one and a half in, in Michigan. Um, these figures are, I think, um, a couple years old. The darker, the higher. This was from 1917, so I'm sure it's increasing. Here are some of the top selling uh, sales. And the, again, this is from the period of 2008 through 2016. That's changing some. As you can see, GM, Nissan, Tesla, Ford, Toyota, BMW, and, and uh, VW. And this is interesting. The uh, total uh, battery, uh, the green slope is the increase in the battery uh, um, powered and the blue is the hybrid. So you can see they're both increasing, but the battery, uh, all electrics are increasing at a much more rapid rate. Fuel cells, that's something they're looking at, but right now um, the problem is, is that uh, first place you don't have fuel charging stations. Uh, you do have electric vehicle charging stations throughout the country. And uh, some companies have their own. Tesla has some of their own. And uh, we'll, we'll talk more about what's happening in, in the future in a minute. Now, if you want to get something like this, you can get a home charger from DTE. They say charging a battery overnight is like paying about a dollar a gallon for gasoline. The average cost to install this is about $1,200. Includes a second meter to take advantage of reduced uh, cost during the night and weekends, and the charger itself is an additional $500. Um, just a personal note, in putting this together, I met with an old friend, Frank Marcus, technical director of Motor Trend Magazine. Uh, we had lunch together and asked him to look over my draft. He gave me some valuable observations. And he has articles on electric trucks and so forth in Motor Trend. Uh, we go back uh, a number of years, like 30 years ago, when he played my son, uh, Tony Kirby in a production of You Can't Take It With You at the, at the Plymouth Theater Guild. Anyway, so what's the future? Uh, and again, uh, no one knows the future, but from the things that we read, the, the, this is what's happening. Plug-in, all electrics are gaining popularity over hybrids. Charging stations are increasing, but many more are needed. Uh, but the... Um, they, they just uh, got approval for 500,000 across the country in the, uh, in the latest um, um, one of the bills that went through Congress, infrastructure bill, I believe. So, uh, and again, many of those will be on freeways. 
So uh, uh, it'll take a while before they'll get out into the small areas, small towns. Um, fuel cells are an alternative, but uh, right now that's kind of in the background. Um, Self-driving electrics are a reality, but probably start with commercial vehicles such as delivery vehicles and taxis. Um, I, I'm guessing in my lifetime, I probably will not have a totally self-driving car where I can just climb in and tell it where to go and uh, it'll go there. But I'll probably ride in some uh, taxis and buses and things that probably won't have a human there. Uh, those, are, those are my guesses. Uh, and again, Ford, GM, and Stellantis, uh, which of course is, is uh, what Chrysler's part of now, are investing big time. Ford building um, plants in Tennessee and Kentucky for batteries, Sterling Heights, uh, transmission plant converted over to electric power. GM, 35 billion. Stellantis, 35 billion. Um, another issue that's uh, come up is uh, the power grid capacity. And uh, so here's my, uh, here's my kind of uh, illustration of that. <clears throat> so we all get electric cars and a bunch of us want to go up to Traverse City on the weekend. And there's already some charging stations up there and a lot of people live there, right? But all of a sudden on a summer weekend, there are a whole bunch of more cars up there. And uh, we all want to plug them in to use them for the weekend. Uh, are there going to be enough charging stations? Is the electric grid going to be able even to handle that many charging stations operating at once? These are all really interesting questions uh, looking ahead. Here are some of the resources I used. Um, uh, the American Automobile Past, Present, and Driverless and Autonomy. Um, a couple more uh, customer issues, and I need to get a slide on this, but. What, what, what do we think about as customers? What are we concerned about? Well, range anxiety. In other words, how far can we go without a charge? That, that's the big one. Um, and a lot of people prefer the hybrid because you do have the, the gasoline powered uh, motor as an auxiliary or backup. Uh, and the cost to buy. These are expensive. The costs are gonna be coming down. Uh, the cost to own uh, over lifetime, according to Consumer Reports, you, you'll save money over the life of a car. Um, the cost to operate, uh, well, cost to replace a battery. If you buy a used one, that's a concern because the battery life goes down uh, over time. So if you buy a, you know, a six or seven year old one, you may not have a lot of battery life left. And again, you may be able to get a new battery and that's maybe 5,000 bucks. So those are, those are all issues. Uh, but the cost to operate, uh, again, uh, you're, you're, you're traveling at about a uh, equivalent of about a buck a gallon of gas. Um, and uh, like to uh, kind of end up with a, with a thing here. People send me things and this is a fun thing. With this, this Bill Gates reportedly, reportedly uh, compared the computer industry with the auto industry. And he stated, if Ford had kept up with technology like the computer industry had, we would all be driving $25 cars that got 1,000 miles to the gallon. In response to Bill's comments, Ford issued a press release stating, if Ford had developed technology like Microsoft, we would all be driving cars with the following characteristics. One, for no reason whatsoever, your car would crash twice a day. Two, occasionally your car would die on the freeway for no reason. You would have to pull to the side of the road, close all the windows, shut off the car, restart it, reopen the windows before you could continue. For some reason, you would simply accept this. Three, the oil, water, and temperature alternator warning lights would be replaced by a single, this car has performed an illegal operation warning light. The airbag system would ask, are you sure before deploying? And five, occasionally for no reason whatsoever, your car would lock you out and refused to let you in until you simultaneously lifted the door handle, turned the key, and grabbed hold of the radio antenna. So uh, that's kind of fun. I'd like to put in a plug here for the Motor Cities National Heritage Area. I'm on the board of directors. Um, this is a part of the National Park Service, but we are the only 
national heritage area in the country out of about 50 to be just related to uh, to automotive. And uh, we're here in this area. And uh, there's the website, motorcities.org. You can go there and you get a weekly automotive history article emailed to you. You don't have to even join. Um, we do like to get members. We get our money from the park service, but we have to have a certain amount of matching funds locally. So become a member for $20, or 30, $20 for seniors, $30 for other folks. And we really do appreciate uh, the memberships. And this provides discounts to many of the local automotive museums. We have a speakers bureau, provides if any of you are in a service club and want to have us come in and talk about motor cities, we can do that for free. If you want a longer presentation such as this, uh, there, there is a fee involved. Um, talking about motor cities, uh, I've done uh, a program for you folks on Henry Ford and on Billy Durant. Uh, and I'm doing one for motor cities on Wednesday, November 16th uh, at noon. So if you want to go to motorcities.org and sign up, uh, they'll give you a link to my program on Chrysler, uh, Wednesday, November 16th at noon, uh, free. Love to have you uh, attend that. Uh, here are the various programs I do. Like I say, I've done uh, several of them here for you folks. And uh, uh, some of them we have, the ones with dots are PowerPoint presentations. The one with squares, we have people that actually represent these characters. For instance, here's one on Henry and Friends. Um, Henry Ford on the left, Thomas Edison in the center, who looks strangely like me, and um, Harvey Firestone. Uh, and we, we interact with the audience and have, have a good time. And they're historically authentic, but a lot of fun. Um, my COVID uh, project was, I uh, finally became an author. Uh, people would ask me when I make presentations, uh, you have a book, and I'd always say, no, there are enough books on these automotive pioneers. And somebody said, you talk about the interaction between a lot of them in the beginning. Why don't you do uh, uh, historical fiction? And that's what I did. So my book, Motor City Drama, behind the scenes, building the big three with Ford, Durant, and Chrysler. I go into meetings which are reported in history, like one where Billy Durant had Henry Ford and others together to form General Motors. It didn't work out. But I make up the conversation within the meeting and have them telling why it doesn't work out talking to each other. It's fun and it's, it's, it's as historically accurate as you could get and it, it brings these people to life. You can get this on Amazon, or Kindle or soft cover, 10 bucks for the hardcover, not, not a bad deal. Good, good Christmas present. Okay. Uh, there's my uh, website down at the bottom, doraproductions.weebly.com. And I always list my public presentations uh, there. I've, I've listed this one. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't think I listed this one because this is a, most of them are libraries and things where people can sign up. But since this was an organization, I, I did not list it. But, um, and at this point, we will take some question and answer. Yes. All right, well, thank you for that very enlightening presentation, Ross. Um, does anybody have any questions? You can feel free to unmute yourself. Go ahead, Ms. Dane. Um, I watched a, a TED talk that talked about how hybrids right now were more efficient than electric vehicles. I think, if I recall correctly, it was because having to stop and charge it so often used more electricity than, than a hybrid vehicle did. Is that accurate and before I think about switching over I have a um I have a Subaru Outback PR EV mm -hmm. so before I think about switching to an electric motor you know at what point does it become more efficient to use and and I go to the UP so that's you know yeah. 350 miles one way so what is your you're thinking of doing what now switching if I were to switch you know when I'm when I've reached the limit on my on my mileage because I love yeah. my car yeah. At what point is it efficient yeah. to switch to an electric motor versus the hybrid? Good. Yeah. You know, I don't know. I, I would be interested. Where, where did you read that? Um, it was on a TED talk and I can't remember oh, okay. who did it, but they were saying that, that the hybrids right now, because of the short distances that the electrical 
engines can go, that it was actually more efficient to have a hybrid because you're using more electricity by stopping to charge it, okay. which <laughs> impacted the environment more okay. than yeah. having a hybrid. I, I guess my feeling at this point would be, particularly if you're going to the UP, uh, I personally, I would feel more comfortable with that gasoline <laughs> combination. <laughs> right. I know my son has a, this uh, Tesla 3, and he lives in California and LA, and they took a trip you know, up, up in the Northern California. And he had to plot it out, you know, and you do too, I'm sure you have to. And I'm thinking, okay, so you have to allow a big, uh, a big buffer there, because if you think I'm going to stop in this little town and there's two charging stations and you get there and one's closed and there's a lineup at the other one, you know, uh, you don't have a lot of alternatives unless you have, again, uh, a lot of range left, you know. Well, I would be interested in, in knowing when that when that new cable that can charge in five yeah. minutes versus an hour, right? Yeah. Then it then it becomes a little more more practical. But I also want it to be environmentally yeah. efficient. Right, right. Yeah, there there is a lot of there are a lot of questions, and 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 again, uh, some people are saying even the bigger questions about um, environmentally to produce all this electricity, if so many of them are produced in coal burning electric plants, uh, you know, does that offset the gains we're making with electric cars? Right, and and is there enough recycling of the batteries right. that that's not an environmental impact yeah. as well? Yeah. yeah, a lot of questions. Well, you know, all I can think of is the, the automotive uh, companies have, have gone through this all. And again, obviously they're in business to provide something that people want and will buy. But uh, I'm sure they've had to think through a lot of this stuff in terms of where it's going and, and how much regulation there's going to be in the future. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating time. Which, um, which company, again, was it that you said was taking the old batteries and able to recover? It was a pretty high percentage of, of the elements inside that battery for reuse. That's, uh, that's a new company uh, formed by one of these guys that left Tesla. Um, right. Let's see here, I can quickly find it. Was that uh, the Wally Ripple? Redwood, yeah. Redwood. Uh, no, this was Staubel, one of the co-founders of Tesla. It's Redwood Industries, I guess, Redwood. Okay, thank you. Re recycle battery elements, yeah. Good questions. Oh, talking about batteries, I did leave this out. I had stuck this in and didn't have a slide, but there's a, a company, right here in Novi that um, is, is making batteries. Uh, and this fella just moved here from, uh, from California. Uh, it's called uh, ONE, um, O-N-E. It stands for Our Next Energy. And uh, this fella has a, a battery that he claims is, is much longer uh, range. He's got investments from Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, uh, Amazon. He's investing 1.6 billion in a plant in Van Buren Township. He's gonna have 2000 employees. I mean, and, and he moved to, the interesting thing is he moved from California to this area because he thinks this is still the center of automotive uh, development. So cool. that's, yeah. Yeah, you can look it up. Novi one O N E. It's just kind of interesting. And I, I need to get a slide on him. Mr. Jacklick, did you have a question? I saw you. I don't know if you were clapping or raising your hands with the little <laughs> icon. Uh, just to thank you and a good presentation. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's fun. Like I say, it's it is an evolving uh, uh, field right away. But uh, uh, we're seeing more and more of these on the road. Uh, I know I've seen several of the uh, Mustangs and the um, uh, what's the truck uh, when I mentioned from Plymouth um, the um, Rivian. You know, you start seeing them around. Are there any other questions for Mr. Dore? Peter, you're muted.
Can't hear you, Peter. Oh, okay. Can you hear me now? <laughs> How are yeah, you? now we can. Yeah. Uh, total unelectric question. Okay. With, with, with your knowledge of the electric industry, is there ever any talk at all about hydrogen engines? Um, well, the, the cells uh, are... Um, I don't know about a hydrogen engine, but the the uh, the fuel cells. Let me look here. Um, I could I could be wrong. I think they're hydrogen. Because yeah, I, I understand Toyota does make mm -hmm. one out in California. Um, yeah, the the uh, they are they are experimenting with them, uh, but um, right now. Uh, the nice thing about those is you just pull in and, and you can refill them quickly. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to charge. Uh, I think it's I think it's hydrogen fuel cell. Uh, I'm looking through my notes. I'm not an engineer, and uh, you, you got me over my head on that one. But, but <laughs> they are uh, uh, the fuel cells uh, are something that they're they're looking at. And and again, the big advantage there is that. Um, you know, you you don't have to charge; you just fill up. But yeah. but how many uh, uh, fuel filling refill stations have you ever seen? <laughs> yeah, not many. But no, you know, the only no. reason I even brought it up is yeah. quite a few years ago I facilitated a Department of Energy conference in Detroit, uh -huh. and hydrogen was the big subject. Yeah, and it yeah. just sort of just totally disappeared. Yeah, well. You, you never know, you know, it could be there's just one little thing in that in the whole system that they need to solve and all of a sudden it'll it'll be big. Yeah. yeah. Because it, it does have that advantage is is that it, it's 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 more like gas. You just fill up. Yep. Uh, you don't you don't have to worry about charging. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, thanks again, Russell. Terrific presentation. Oh, thanks. It's a lot of fun. So. I would like to thank you for a, again, for a very entertaining evening and thank you for your time. And we look forward to the next time we see you. Great. Great. Thanks again. That was thank great. You, thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.